All righty, let's talk about how KCP and Kubernetes support logical clusters or workspaces. So um, just to recap what we talked about briefly off recording, KCP embeds a fork of Kubernetes that has been modified to be logical cluster aware. The fork is never intended to be externally visible to anyone trying to code clients and controllers against KCP. It is only for internals of KCP to function. So existing clients or existing controllers that are able to talk to Kubernetes or OpenShift or anything that looks like Kubernetes or OpenShift from an API perspective will continue to function. Discovery exists. Uh, so everything you could do in client go, uh, you can do against a KCP workspace. Some resources may not exist. So like KCP doesn't have pods out of the box. So if you have a controller that's trying to manipulate pods and you point it at KCP, it's probably not gonna work. But if you're just working with namespaces and custom resource instances, all of those mechanics will function. If you're trying to write a controller or a client that is able to talk to multiple or across multiple logical clusters, that requires some additional coding, but we're trying to provide some helper libraries to make that easy. So um, we have a, a document that we haven't merged yet, but we will try and get it merged soon that shows how we have modified etcd to be multi-logical cluster aware. So what's important to look at is uh, if you look at the normal current storage mechanism or storage pattern, everything's under registry, subdivided by group, resource, uh, and then in, in Kubernetes or OpenShift, there is no cluster. It's just group, resource, an optional namespace, and then a name. And for, uh, for KCP, this we add a cluster segment in between the resource and either the namespace or name for all of our built-in types. So that's for namespaces, secrets, services, or sorry, service accounts, that sort of thing. Uh, anything that is a custom resource instance will have registry, group, resource, and then either an identity or the fixed string custom resources. For the purpose of this discussion, what those mean is not relevant, so I'm going to skip over it. And then just like we saw down here, we do have a cluster segment that precedes an optional namespace and the name. And this is how we introduce multiple logical clusters into an etcd store that's back in KCP. And then all of the code in the KCP fork of Kubernetes, which is in KCP dev Kubernetes. Um, so everything in this fork has been modified to support the multiple logical clusters that uh, are visible in the entity storage patterns here. Let me pause there. Any any questions on any of this? Uh, yeah, so for the, the cluster uh, segment that there can be a hierarchy there, right? Um, no, uh, the hierarchy uh, is contained wholly within this segment. So it could be something like um, root colon red hat colon engineering. Okay. So we use a colon to separate right. in, uh, in that hierarchy. So we are... Um, guaranteed that there's only ever one level of nesting when it comes to specifying the cluster just because we we maintain that hierarchy within a single stream okay good question though all right so how do we do all of this so uh, basically if you go into our fork which is what i have open on the screen here anywhere that you see uh, a KCP dev logical cluster import is somewhere that we're doing something with 
logical clusters. Um, so let me find, uh, I'm just going to be showing some examples here. I think um, you can probably grep for this on your own. And then if there's individual uh, questions that you have, totally open and happy to, to answer those questions. Uh, but just as some examples, I'm inside of uh, staging source kates.io API server package storage etcd3 store.go. So this is where we're interacting directly with etcd at the storage layer. And so um, one key thing that we do is there's a decode function that is invoked when getting from etcd after creating an object and it's been stored in etcd and when doing conditional deletes and guaranteed updates. So if you look at get, for example, uh, get will determine the logical cluster name from the context. This is something that KCP is responsible for setting in a couple different places. Um, I don't know why my font size went down, but... Um, if we trace, like you'll see that there's a whole bunch of places where this with cluster function is invoked. And so you can go look in the places here and they're also in KCP. So um, let me pull over KCP, hold on a second. No, oh, I actually closed it. That was weird. Uh, da, da, da. All righty. Oh, that's what I was looking for. Command shift dot. Okay. Or control shift dot. So if I go in and look for. Cluster. No, we're not doing it. Okay, never mind. I'll come back to that later. Um, but suffice it to say, there is a cluster name, a logical cluster name that has been added to the context. I'll have to go back and double check where it got added. But in this particular code flow, we are retrieving a key from etcd. Once we have retrieved the data, we pass it to decode. Decode will do some decoding, and then you'll see we have a KCP comment here that says, we need to apply the cluster name to the decoded object as the name is not persisted in storage. This is key because we are not storing anything about the logical cluster that the data in etcd is associated with in etcd. So what we do is we know the cluster name from the context mainly because when you're doing, when you make a request to Kubernetes, the request pattern that we have looks like uh, one of these. So this is an actual URL path that KCP would receive from a client. It would be slash clusters, and then you would have a cluster name, and then the remainder of the request would be a standard request that you would make to Kubernetes or OpenShift. So slash APIs, some group, some version, some resource. It could be slash API slash V1 slash secrets. Um, so anything you can do in terms of metrics, health, liveness probes, um, APIs, API requests, all of these have a prefix with the cluster there. So when you're looking at um, this, that you know that the cluster name generally came from the URL, and uh, we actually store the cluster name as an annotation, and that annotation is kcp.dev slash cluster. So um, once we are decoding data that's coming out of etcd, we set that. And then that is available to 
anywhere in the code base that needs to work with it. And the, um, the logical cluster package or repository that's in KCP allows you to take any, basically anything that has a get annotations method on it, which is all Kubernetes objects, and you can call logical cluster dot from, and that will return a logical cluster name that's been decoded from those annotations. And so what you'll see um, is logical cluster dot from. So you'll see in a lot of places uh, here the namespace controller, for example, or this is the um, yeah the namespace controller is using the logical cluster for a namespace to figure out what logical cluster we need to delete things. The, um, there's a whole lot in here. So uh, custom resources, for example, will take a look at the CRD, get its logical cluster, and use that as part of establishing CRDs. So there's a whole bunch of code in Kubernetes in our fork where we are, are you know, injecting or doing some logic that involves the logical cluster. Let me pause there. <laughs> what, what questions might you have? Uh, you're on mute, Jamie. Yeah, sorry about that. So um, my question about uh, um, is about the the annotation. Uh, so in that case, annotation is part of the the object data, right? Uh, yeah. That's stored in at CD. No, it's not stored in etcd. It's only available on the wire when it's being decoded. OK. OK. Um, so, so logical cluster is not really a cluster. It's um, a way to distinguish um, or or, or I have some isolation in the objects being stored in the storage. Is that a fair description? Yeah, so a logical cluster is meant to be like a real cluster where you have cluster scoped resources like namespaces or um, cluster role cluster roles and cluster role bindings. You also have namespace scoped resources like config maps. And all of that is what you would expect to find in a normal Kubernetes cluster. But in KCP, because we want to have the appearance of isolated clusters within a single API that you can access, each isolated cluster is what we're calling a logical cluster. So uh, one advantage to this is if you and I are both sharing KCP and I have a logical cluster and you have a logical cluster, we can each create the exact same CRD in terms of group, version, and resource, but my CRD could look 100% different from your CRD and they will not collide with each other. I can't do any CRUD operations on CRs from your logical cluster for that CRD unless you give me access to it, and vice versa, you can't do that with mine. And so it, it from that perspective, it is like N clusters in one process. Right. So um, one question I have is um, when when there's a so I know that a workspace is mapped to a logical cluster. So each time yeah. you create a workspace, you you have a new logical cluster in in the KCP um, server, right? Yeah. So every workspace has a logical cluster. Not every logical cluster has a workspace. And the, the logical clusters that don't have workspace are reserved for internal KCP system use. 
Um, so there are privileged KCP admin level clients that can go do things with these logical clusters that don't have workspaces, but you generally don't need to know much about that or worry about that. Um, so yes, like a workspace is a logical cluster. There are more things you can do with a workspace that there's like extra features that are in there above and beyond just saying it's a division of etcd. So from a, a user's point of view, um, a user doesn't really see logical cluster, right? When when the user is inter interacting with the, the API server, it's through the whichever workspace that he is in. Yeah. Um, now you can switch workspaces. Right. Um, but that, that also means switching a logical cluster, right? Yep. Because there's a one to one mapping. Yes. And um, controllers do have the ability to see data across many logical clusters in, like, they have the ability to do. Um, what we call wildcard uh, lists and watches. So if you make a request that looks like this, you will get instances of the group version and resource that come from lots of different logical clusters or workspaces. There are some special requirements for uh, what you must do to make this work, but they're they're straightforward, and so you can, um, if you're trying to write a controller, uh, let's say that you're, I don't know, you're doing cert manager because that's our canonical example. So cert manager today only operates against things in a single cluster. Makes sense that that's what clusters are. They're standalone. Cert manager could be updated so that you could install one copy of it and it could handle certificate requests in any logical cluster across all of them. Um, if you don't rewrite or modify Cert Manager or any other controller, then you have to have one copy installed per workspace looking at that workspace. Uh, or I should say, you need to run one copy looking at each workspace. It can live wherever. Um, but the cool thing is about the wildcards is that it will allow you to reduce the number of instances that you have to run while being able to support consumers or users who span multiple workspaces. And, and how do you configure the, um, uh, the actual workspaces that can be visible to that controller? Using so we, we have something called an API export. So this is a, another concept or a different topic where you, the, the mentality or mental idea here is I am an API provider. I want to own my APIs and I want to own the implementations of those APIs and I want to share them with people. So to do that, I would create something that looks very much like a CRD, but it's called an API resource schema. I create an API export that points at one or more API resource schemas. It just references them by name. And then um, once I have that API export defined, then I am able to look at its status and there's a special URL in there that I would consume and use. And if I access that URL, I have the ability to do a wildcard list and watch. And, the, and I, can do, um, I can do individual CRUD operations per logical cluster or per workspace. So uh, if I know that you have a certificate signing request in your workspace ABC123, I would have a URL that looks like clusters ABC123 
certificate signing requests and I'd be able to do stuff with that. Um, let me, I don't let's see if I have an example. Uh, I don't have an API export. Actually, I might, hold on just a second. Let me pull this off screen and see. Um, server run name, so let's see. Just a second. Okay, here we go. So I have my local KCP running, and you'll, I'm in the root workspace, which is just our top level workspace. And so if I get, um, we'll look at tenancy. What you'll see down here at the bottom, it's pop, is this URL that shows up. So if I do this, so I can put in that my URL is services, API export, root, and then the name of the export, you know, this is the URL that I got, and then I do clusters star, and this will give me discovery for everything that's in here. And so I could say um, get cluster workspaces. Oh, whoops. Um. Or might not work. Okay. Um, I oh I don't have any. I must not have any bindings on this. All right. I'm not going to try and make this work on the fly. But basically, um, this is what you would do: is you would you would go through the virtual workspace URL for the API export, and then you'd be able to see these things and operate on them. So if I wanted to do something on a single um, single one, it could be you know root ABC one two three. And if this particular thing existed, I could uh, I could get it, I could create it, I could list it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um I know like you, in terms of like priority and fairness, um, oh, object I don't remember the name of the I looked at this code once before. Actually, I think I had an issue for it. Um, Hold on. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Um, two, two, so this function in uh, staging Kate's API server package registry generic registry store go. This starts the observer that periodically tracks object counts per resource name. And this is um, created when, where is this? So inside of complete with options, which sets up storage for a particular resource, it does call this start observing count. And the problem with this is that this basically is monitoring. Uh, this gets invoked once per API type. So like once for secrets, once for config maps, once for widgets, whatever you're doing. And it's going to do an object count based on the prefix. And the 
prefix that this thing is doing is based on the cluster, but the cluster that it's putting in is a wild card. And there's some um, some hackery that we did. So if, if you're doing a star, which is the wild card request, then the prefix ends up just being uh, in etcd registry group resource. That ends up, that's the prefix. And so this ends up counting all instances of whatever your resource is across all logical clusters. Because if you count where this is the prefix, it's going to include cluster one, cluster two, cluster three. Uh, and so the idea that I had in my head for how to attack this problem was that while we can start observing for that global prefix, you kind of need something that is watching for workspaces. And when a workspace is created, you start a track or start one of these observers for each workspace. But we probably don't really want to include or can't really include any KCP code like cluster workspaces as an import in here. So we need to find some way to be able to, um, like from within KCP, get Kubernetes to start these observers based on events like a workspace being uh, added, but make it generic enough so that we have the, the ability to do that without importing the cluster workspace types into Kubernetes, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm trying to understand. So you're you're giving this as an example when uh, when you need to uh, you're you're saying um, if you do want to di di distinguish the the workspace, uh, this would not be the way because it's using a wildcard to uh to to replace the cluster name in the prefix um so yes and no like the biggest problem is this is called once per api type right so if i create a thousand workspaces that has no bearing on this function being invoked because it's invoked when the API type is added to the API server. So that's when the built-in types like secrets are registered. It's whenever a CRD is created, um, it's going to do that uh, per CRD. And especially with the API export bit that I was showing a few minutes ago, um, when I create an API export for certificate signing requests, that does turn into a CRD, but it's only just one. It's like one CRD that represents certificate signing requests that are going to live in a whole bunch of different workspaces. So if, um, if we want priority and fairness to use object counts and those object counts need to be segmented per logical cluster slash per workspace then we have to do something that can start counters and track counters per logical cluster and resource as opposed to just per resource right right um, I apologize. I, I need to end this a little bit early. I'm starting to get like a, a floater in my vision. So mm -hmm. um, I kind of want to go and lie down. Uh, okay. But yeah, that's please, fine. 
please continue to ask questions in Slack. And right. um, when I'm not having something flashing in my vision, I'm <laughs> happy to chat more. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I need some time to digest uh, whatever you just said and um, look more into the code. And um, I might have some questions about how you know an incoming request is dispatched, or does it really make any difference if there it the request is to CRD within an a workspace or or it doesn't really make a difference um the when i say make a difference i mean is it the same hand um handler chain that's servicing that or yeah uh, yeah so there's no like um individual handler chain per workspace right it's all served by the same handler chain but there might be different actions depending on the workspace or, or logical cluster there is an CRD individual chain. hand or there is a shared handler chain for pretty much all requests um resource quota is running a variety of go routines per workspace so we like ju that's just an example of where right we have multiple controller instances and multiple admission instances where it's one per workspace. Uh, we'll do the same thing for garbage collection when we implement it. Um, other things like the tokens controller, rather than running one token controller per logical cluster, we run one token controller and it's handling across logical clusters. So depending on what part of the code base you're in, things may be different. But in terms of request handler, it is one handler that's doing everything for incoming API requests. OK. OK. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, try to understand the code a bit more, and then I'll come back with some more questions. Thank you for um, this session. OK, you're welcome. Um, and. Please reach out in the future. Uh, happy to provide more details. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. I'll see you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.